welcome back to lesson six of this introduction to designing for the web. In this lesson, we get to the heart of what design for the web is all about. We're going to look and discuss usability and simplicity. You see, when you're designing for the web, you're designing an interaction. Users are going to actively engage with your design, which is in stark contrast to print design when the most a reader ever does is turn a page. That means we need to design with the user's interaction front and center in our mind through the whole process, an interaction that we need to keep as simple as possible. And that starts with the three ways a user can interact with us online, links, buttons, and forms. The problem is that as designers, we're often so intent on making our designs beautiful that we fail to make them usable. Links, buttons and forms are a great example of where things can go wrong if you're looking at the wrong thing. Take, for example, the humble link, the bedrock of our interactions online. Those underlines can get pretty ugly, especially when you have a lot of them on the page. And that's why many designers choose to hide the underline, at least until the user rolls over the link. But how is the user supposed to know what is a link and what's not? Color itself is not enough because not everybody sees color in the same way. In any way, colors might indicate something other than it being a link. This template on Template Monster perfectly demonstrates the problem. I love the design of this site, but the links let it down. They rely solely on color to show you what is a link and what isn't. And if you take that away, suddenly it becomes near impossible to recognize the links. Of course, we can always go in and tweak that. And look how much better it looks with the underlines in place. Okay, not visually better, but so much more obvious. Then there are those visited links. Those that make the interaction at times look even more ugly with different color links in different places. But again, that differentiation between visited links is important for orientating the user on the site. Always make your links look like links and always make visited and unvisited links appear differently. Finally, don't forget to make a link react when you click on it. Depending on the user's connection, there might be a, a pause before the page refreshes and that can leave the user wondering whether they clicked a link or not. And that's why it's important to make sure the link itself reacts. The same is true for buttons. When a user clicks on a button, that button should respond in some way. Also, just like a link needs to clearly look like a link, so a button needs to clearly look like a button. Some designers have become so caught up in the current trend of flat design that it's almost impossible to tell if something is clickable, if it's a clickable button or not. That's why I like this toy shop on Template Monster. It uses flat design, but ensures that buttons look and behave like buttons, mainly because of the addition of an icon and a subtle drop shadow. Also notice how there's a clear change on rollover so users are confident it's a clickable element. Finally, there are forms too. Entire books have been written on the subject designing for forms, and I can't cover all of that here. But for now, I just want to give you one piece of advice as you start out designing. Don't change the default appearance of forms too much. The basic form design provided in all browsers is pretty good. Sure, it doesn't look pretty, but it is usable. And if you are going to make changes to how it looks, it's a visual appearance, make sure that that doesn't come at the cost of usability. Fields should look like fields. Radio buttons and checkboxes should look and behave like you would expect. It needs to be clear how you interact with these things. And that's why I love this e-commerce site from Template Monster. It customizes the uh, default appearance of form fields to make them considerably more attractive, but it's not lost their basic functionality. It's clean, usable, but most importantly, it's obvious. But usability is not just about the tools of interaction, links, forms, and buttons. It's also about how clean and simple your design is. Today, we're faced with a huge quantity of information that we're expected to sift through thanks to the web. And as a result, we've become ruthless in filtering out information. If a website is not obvious and quickly gives us the answer we want, then we simply go elsewhere. 
That's why good design should aid in finding information and not get in the way. The design should support your content and that means keeping your designs clean, simple and intuitive. This means that every element in our design needs to justify itself. Does it really need to be there? Does it actually help the user or is it just pushing some business agenda? Worse still, is it designed for design's sake? Are your design decisions about helping user interactions or is it just about making something nice for your portfolio? Most important of all is whether that screen element distracts from more important content. Too often we add content and design elements to our site to help a user complete some tiny task. Our motivation is good. But in doing so, we're making it harder for users to complete the more important top tasks that exist on our site. With each element you add to your design, you need to pass it through the following thought process. First, ask yourself, can this element be removed? Is it really necessary? If the answer is yes, ask yourself whether it could be moved deeper into the site so it doesn't get in the way of more important elements. If you don't feel it can be removed or moved, your final option is to shrink it. Can you de-emphasize this element so it doesn't distract the user from more important tasks? Of course, this is all very easy to say, but getting clients to agree to stripping out content can be more challenging. One solution to this is to take them through the user point exercise, user attention. This exercise begins by asking the client and other stakeholders to list every element on their homepage, every element that they want to appear on their homepage. Typically, this turns out to be a fairly long list. Then you explain that users only have limited attention and that for the sake of this exercise, we're gonna represent that attention in user attention points. Give them, say, 17 points of user attention and tell them to assign those points to each element that they want on their homepage, each element on their list. If they want more attention to be focused on one item over another, then they need to assign more attention points to it. For example, if they want uh, users to look at a call to action before the footer, then they need to make sure that that call to action has more points assigned to it than the footer. This exercise forces them to prioritize, but often clients kind of resist that. They'll spread their points very thinly, giving most items one or two points, enabling them to add as many items to the page as possible. If they do this, I tend to show them either or both the Yahoo homepage and the Google homepage. I then ask them which of these two pages is better, and without fail, they all say Google. I explain that the reason the Google homepage is better is because they've spent all of their user attention points on the search box, while Yahoo has spread those points about. I then point out that essentially they've done the same thing and they've built a Yahoo style homepage. And that quickly changes their attitude. When interface elements are stripped back and you've got the minimum that you can get away with, it's much easier to design a simple, clean and intuitive interface. But you can still ruin that if you don't allow elements to breathe. The more elements are crammed together, the busier things become. For example, take a look what happens if we remove all the white space from this template monster template. See how hard it is to distinguish between the different elements and how cluttered the design starts to look. That's because white space is an incredibly powerful design tool. It reduces distractions, it aids scannability, but most importantly, it can be used to draw the eye to important elements. So take, for example, that Google search box. Pixel for pixel is not much bigger than the Yahoo search box. However, Google has put so much white space around their search box, it jumps out at you. It really stands out. So the next time a client asks you to make their logo bigger, suggest try trying to add some white space instead. You may well find that that satisfies them. So that's all that we have time for in this lesson. To be honest, we've only just scratched the surface of what's involved in creating a usable design, but hopefully you can see how important it is. You see, design serves a purpose, and that purpose is to help users complete their tasks. If it doesn't do that, then it's more art than it is design. 
The secret to achieving this is to ruthlessly remove distractions, make every element justify itself. But it's more than that. It's also about making your designs obvious. Buttons, links and forms need to be obvious and behave as you would expect them to behave. If you want to break these conventions and innovate, then fine, I fully encourage that. But if you're gonna do that, you need to spend a lot of time testing your designs to ensure that the user will understand what you've done and they won't just leave. Next time on this Introduction to Designing for the Web, we're gonna turn our attention to online branding. How do you take a client's brand and apply it to their website and what can go wrong in the process? But until then, Thanks for watching.